Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome co-author of Politico Playbook, Anna Palmer, the president of Americans for Prosperity, Tim Phillips, and former chief strategist and senior advisor to President Obama and director of the University of Chicago Institute of Politics, David Axelrod. guys. Thanks so much for joining us this afternoon. I'm excited to sit down with you all. It's good to see you. So we have Tim here and David, and we're going to jump right in because we don't have a ton of time and we have a lot to cover in the age of information overload. Uh, one of the things I wanted to start with here is we're obviously all gathered here around the UN General Assembly. You have a lot of world leaders who are trying to send a message here to the UN, and they're probably trying to message something differently, potentially back home. Do you think that that is even, you know, is that, are we able to do that now, given Twitter and, and the internet and how people are consuming news? Can you kind of really micro-target your different audiences? I know, Tim, this is something you focus a lot on. Yeah, I, I think the, the president's main audience today is probably the American electorate, I, I would guess. Mm -hmm. And so it's, uh, an instance where you're speaking to people, but the real audience is, you know, 60 or 80 million swing Americans and base conservatives, you know, in your own country uh, here in the United States. Uh, it is difficult to micro-target your message now. I, I think that where politicians get in the most trouble is where they try to slice it up in too fancy a manner. <laughs> they actually think they can say something to one group that somehow won't get reported to another group, so they'll say things to their base. And then, so the know, wink, wink, or, nudge, or nudge doesn't quite work. Or to their work. donors. Yeah, to their donors. <laughs> I, I think that's where they get in trouble. H have a message that is sincere enough uh, and, frankly, broad enough that you don't have to try to get too clever with it. Because that's where they normally get into trouble, and it hurts them with both their base and with swing voters or with, with donors and activists. Yeah. No, I, I agree with that. And I think it's one of the things that's challenging to our democracy is that we now have the tools to slice and dice in ways that uh, make it harder to deliver a message that might engender a broad acceptability. But on your point about world leaders coming here and they have different audiences and so on, one of the challenges for the U.S. right now is that um, the president, he took a position on America first, uh, and that, that was heard around the world. And his, his polling numbers are, are not good in a lot of places in the world. And all politics is local. So there's actually currency for politicians in other countries to attack the president, to take a tougher line on the U.S., and I think that's a challenge. So let's take a step back here. You guys have been in politics for a long time, not to, to age you or anything. Thank you for that, Anna, very much, you're welcome, yeah. You're welcome. But in Tim was one of my boyhood idols, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but I wanted to ask you, kind of as a zoom out question, what do you think is really the biggest change you guys have seen in your careers as political strategists, how you guys operate? Is it just the 24-hour news cycle, the, the one-minute news cycle now with Twitter, or you know, when you kind of think about how people are consuming information, how campaigns are actually being run? I, I think, for, for me, um, activist, base activist on the right and the left, I, I'll speak to activists on our side, the more, the, the more right side, uh, they are incredibly knowledgeable now. They, they have access to information. So 15 years ago, when I would go out and talk about earmarks and how wasteful they are and how they are you know, a gateway drug to bigger spending for the government, you would have audiences out across the country, and these were really smart folks, but they just didn't really quite you know, know what an earmark was back then. Today, if you go out and talk about sometimes the most minute policy or the most minute issue, they get it, because they have access to so much more information now. They can choose from a broad buffet of, of sources, sure. uh, and they're just so much more knowledgeable. I think that's actually a really good thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think one, one of the challenges with that is they have access to a lot of information. Whether that information is right or not that's is fair. a different question, and so you can see people stoked up uh, sometimes over things that, that aren't true, and, um, and we do tend, it has made us more tribal uh, in our politics, but the point you raise, and you feel it as a, a I started as a newspaper reporter, right. uh, and we used to have this thing, the quaint thing, I don't know if anybody's heard of these, called news cycles, <laughs> where hey. you actually had a day to contemplate right. 
what you were going to write and to actually report on it. And now, uh, the, you know, we're in the Twitter world and there's immediate reaction to everything. Things get torqued out of proportion. And if you're running particularly a, a high profile campaign, you have to be really sensitive to the environment and understand which things are actually rabbits that you should chase and which are rabbits going down the hole. Mm -hmm. And um, so uh, it, it is more challenging. That kind of brings up two points I wanted to touch on. Uh, one, a little bit of fake news, right? Is the news accurate that people are receiving? There's been a, obviously a big debate post the 2016 election about this. Is that something that can be controlled? Is it something you guys are focused on? Or is it just you want to put out the what you believe is facts and, and hope people can kind of figure out the difference? Yeah, I have to say, the idea of fake news and, and everything is, you know, can you really trust sources? That's not a new issue. I, I just read an account of the, 18, of the Jefferson Adams election not long ago. And people talk about, oh, it's nasty and it's tough these days. Go back and read an account <laughs> sure. of the Adams-Jefferson election or the John Quincy Adams, uh, Alexander uh, or, or uh, Jackson election of 1824. It's always been hard hitting and tough in the electorate. That, so I, I'm not as concerned about that. That's happened in our history. I think that's not a bad thing. I think the battle of ideas out there is a good thing, Anna. And I, I think the idea of controlling news I, that, that troubles me, I think. I, I have a broad marketplace of ideas. Americans that I meet, and I'm traveling on the road. I was in Reno, Nevada. Before that, I was in the Chicago suburbs, your old area. Before that, I was in Fort Wayne, Indiana. I had a, I had a worry that you were around. I had a sense. There was an aura. There was an aura. But, but the Americans are smart. Sure. They, they can figure out when something sounds a little weird, and every once in a while, something will break through and, and confuse some folks. But I, I trust the American electorate in this regard, and so I think it's overblown. But na nastiness is not new. In that election you mentioned with right. Jackson and Adams, the Adamsites put out a, uh, a pamphlet, so the, the, a, pa a catalog of the youthful indiscretions of General <laughs> Andrew Jackson from ages 13 to 64. <laughs> uh, so that, that, that is not new. What is new is the media environment and the way information is transmitted. So a story can circulate, for example, that Hillary Clinton is harboring uh, you know, a, a sex trafficking ring uh, in the basement of a pizzeria in uh, Washington and two and a half million people download that story and somebody comes up there who actually believes it with a gun and breaks into the place. That is a little different than what they faced in those days. We, they, fought technology, the, they fought duels in the early 1800s. I they mean. did. No, no. And, and, <laughs> and, and, and right, right over here that. in Weehawken, New Jersey, right. Aaron Burr so. killed Alexander Hamilton. Uh, but it wasn't over. It, that was, I'm not excusing Aaron Burr, <laughs> but that was not over uh, some phony uh, story that trafficked on uh, a social media site without any uh, refutation. Uh, so uh, for those people who downloaded it. So I, I think it's a, it's a, we should not minimize the challenges we have. One of my concerns is we live in times when technology offers enormous capacity for people to connect with the world, but it also has this micro-targeting capacity that can be very insidious, and you know, we've, we've seen how uh, even foreign actors have employed it, and we need to think through how we're going to cope with this in the future, because it is a threat to our democracy. We talked a little bit ago about kind of chasing rabbits down holes and as an operative trying to figure out when do you actually put a response out or when do you not. We all move on so fast in the news industry. I think we're very guilty of kind of the next crisis, moving on to the next point of conflict. What kind of, when you're thinking about that or giving advice, or what advice would you have, David, for your uh, Democratic counterparts right now in terms of how do you actually pick what's going to matter? Yeah, well, I think that's really important. I mean, I felt that acutely when I was in the White House because every day in Washington is Election Day. Every event is the most decisive. This will determine the, uh, the Obama presidency. We had an oil leak, you'll remember, in the mm -hmm. Gulf of Mexico, and it created quite a furor uh, because we, co we, couldn't, we could get a camera down a mile to show the oil leaking, but we couldn't figure out what to do about it for a while. And it was a cable TV had a clock and a, mm -hmm. so it was a, but, uh, and there was, this is Obama's Katrina. This will define him. Uh, this is the decisive event of his election. I don't remember it coming up once in 2012. 
This was in 2010. And it's important to remember not to get caught up in the hysteria of the moment and understand what your fundamental message is and who you're talking to and not get knocked off of that. You have to deal with the thing in front of you, but you shouldn't get overwhelmed by it. I agree with that. I think that all of the sound and fury over the president's comments on a daily basis, I hear reporters say, is this the tipping point? As if there's some magical tweet that's going to suddenly tip the country one way or the other. The truth is, if they get tax reform done, if Republicans in the House and the Senate and this president get a substantial, bold tax reform that gets the economy moving at a certain level, that actually gives Americans a sense that they can accomplish something on a big issue, which the American public looks at the tax code and goes, they go, it's too complex, it favors the rich and the powerful, let's unrig it, let's actually make it something that works for everybody. If they do that in the next four or five months, they'll hold their majorities in 18. His numbers will go up, the economy will boom, and that'll be despite whatever the fury is over the tweet of the day. That is a big if, if they can get that done. Yeah, I would say so. It hasn't been been done in 30 years, and the the environment isn't exactly uh, uh, receptive to that kind of... But to your your question, that's the point, though, Anna. The American public, they tend to sift what's happening out there, whether it's the latest Bernie Sanders getting up and saying, hey, the... you know, the, the, the real solution on health care is to have a you know, one-size-fits-all government-run thing. Americans sift that, they sift tweets and everything else, and they look at what's really going to hopefully make their lives better. Because I'm telling you, this country right now has an enormous amount of anxiety. There's anger on the two, the, the hard right and the hard left. But in the middle, there's a deep anxiety about something's not quite right. I, I don't see the opportunities I had. We're becoming a two-tiered society. And there's, there's an anxiety that the party that can figure out how to address that, and I think it's by policies that move them forward rather than by rhetoric, that's the party that's going to win, I'm telling you. I think this we should point out, because this is a global audience, that this is not, I know Tony Blair was here earlier, this is not a phenomenon that's uh, only an American phenomenon. This is an a, 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 um, artifact or a, a, an effect of this rapidly changing uh, world in which we yeah. live. That, and uh, you know, if government can't be agile enough to react and deal with some of the changes that are being wrought, it's gonna continue to erode people's confidence in, de- yeah. in democracy. Let's talk about that a little bit. One of the things we, we were speaking before this panel, talking about gridlock in Washington, and how, you know, is this going to be a moment right now where the president has reached out with the Democrats, uh, Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi on DACA, on immigration, trying to come together to find a deal for a deal. Do you think that in this modern kind of digital era, deals like that can be cut? Because they seem like they had an agreement. Everybody kind of left this Chinese dinner last week, kind of in a kumbaya moment. And then all of a sudden, cable news happens, well, Twitter shows happen. We have have I'm everybody a, on both sides kind of trying to push that down. I'm a, I'm a New Yorker, Anna, so I know that those Chinese meals are great. But you know, <laughs> a little while later, you're hungry again. Same thing, <laughs> same, same thing about these deals that are struck over Chinese food. No, listen, um, I I think that um, the real wild card here is the President of the United States and what motivates him. And, you know, he had seven months of uh, very partisan um, alliances that produced nothing for him. And so he may conclude that, you know, it's hard to be the master of the art of the deal if you don't make any deals. And he may conclude that there's profit in, in doing that for him. But I don't know how long that lasts. If the thing goes sideways, does he then shift in a different direction? And he will take heat from uh, some of the base. You know, Breitbart called him uh, Amnesty Don. Right. Uh, I'm sure he noticed that. So uh, you know, it 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 is not. We we are in uncharted waters here, and he holds the key in many ways to to whether this is a a, a temporary alliance. Mm or whether there's more uh, profit in it. Yeah, I, I think Republicans are in a precarious situation right now. And I say that because in th- there have been six national elections since 2006. Five of those six have been dramatic change elections. Five of six, 2006, Democrats took the Congress. 2008, uh, the President, uh, or Barack Obama came in, 2010, the Democrats lost 63 seats and lost the House. 2014, Republicans won the Senate. 2016, Donald Trump happened. Uh, there's been one non-change election. 
thank you, David, so much for 2012, uh, getting the, uh, President Obama reelected. But Republicans are in a precarious situation. The American people are voting continually now for change. Give us change. We don't like this direction. The Republicans have to deliver something, and that means big and bold, and we'll see if they can do it. Or if they can reach across the aisle. I mean, I know Senator Heitkamp and a few other senators are looking at tax reform and some other issues. The, the budget deal last week with Pelosi and, and Schumer, or do we have to call them Chuck and Nancy? I'm not sure what to call them now, but uh, Republicans think they're in a precarious situation. They've got to deliver change, or they're going to be out in 18. Well, talk about that a little bit. I mean, one of the things that the president has done very well is branding himself, right? He's a master of branding throughout his entire career. When we were talking before, and I, I talked to a lot of Democrats about this, where there's the Donald Trump brand and then there's the Republican brand. And Democrats are trying to find some stickiness between the two. And so far, Republicans in the polling that they've done haven't seen that kind of bleed over. Where do you think that stands? How much of an effort will you see kind of on both sides to either make sure the brand stays separate for the midterm election or potentially have, have some, you know, kind of carryover? Well, I think in those swing districts, uh, there will be an effort to tie the, the member uh, to the president, and the members are going to probably make an effort uh, to show some independence mm -hmm. uh, from him. Um, I don't know how effective that tactic uh, will be, but it'll be more effective if, as Tim suggests, the impression is that uh, the, the, there's, there's gridlock, there's chaos, nothing's been accomplished. Nothing's changed. Nothing's changed. Uh, and so, um, you know, these next few months will be important. And um, it'll be interesting. I find the paradox here that the president's making deals with, with Nancy and Chuck over things like DACA um, at the same time that he seems to be supporting challenges from the right to some sitting uh, members of Congress, either overtly or covertly encouraging those. So um, bipartisanship on the one hand and uh, encouraging uh, partisan retrenchment on the other. So I, I just don't know where he's going with that. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, so far, to your point, voters are differentiating between their members of Congress, House or Senate, and, and the President. I, I, and to David's point, it's a good one. Will that sustain deep into a 2018 uh, cycle? And I don't know, no one knows the answer to that. Will, will voters say, okay, Trump's a different, he's more of a Trump brand than a Republican, a traditional Republican like George W. Bush was or others. I'm gonna look at my House or Senate member. The, I don't think they will differentiate if there are no accomplishments to look back on. I mean, if the economy's not moving at a rate that's better than it is right now, and if they can't point to some genuinely significant and, and big accomplishments. Some good things have happened, but I, I think they've, they've got to do more. They have to. So one of the questions I get asked a lot is, where do I get my news? We're in a panel on the information overload. Where do you guys, what are your top sources you're going to every day to kind of sift through the clutter? Well, political. Political. Of political. I mean, oh, yeah. I, mean, I political. Man, so I mean, come on. Wow. I mean, <laughs> oh, it's political. Every, every, my man, in fact, let me pull my app out right now. Wow, Anna. No, I. <laughs> I can tell you that Americans, it's a buffet, I'm, it really is. Uh, they, they, they surf a lot. Um, the Wall Street Journal is, is crucial for, uh, for business folks. I mean, I, when, whether you're in Reno, Nevada, or, or Fort Wayne, Indiana, if you talk to a business person, man and woman, they will have looked at the journal that day. Um, it's, it's such a wide buffet now, mm -hmm. other than Politico, which is the one constant, of course. In, in the, yeah, but uh, it is a wide buffet, but what you find are different categories of voter tend to go to one part of the buffet, you know? Sure. So some are eating salads, some are eating meat. And I'm a dessert guy, just be very clear <laughs> about that. I think they can look at us both and decide who the dessert guy is. <laughs> uh, but the, uh, uh, but the, 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 the thing that worries me is that um, it is easy to sort of uh, get in your silo. It was remarkable to me in the Trump election. You know, there were people who were, um, I, I live in Chicago and I have a place in rural Michigan. All my neighbors in Chicago were, uh, virtually all of them were voting for Hillary Clinton. All my neighbors in Michigan had Trump signs in their yards. And um, each couldn't understand how their candidate wasn't well ahead. And, uh, and a lot of those folks get their news from different places. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I mean, Republic, Fox News is a, has 
consolidated sort of Republicans as, as the principal news source uh, to a remarkable degree. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's nothing quite like that on the, on the Democratic side, but clearly people get their news from other places. And, you know, it is, so you, you do have this issue that you began with, which is we, we have different sets of facts that lead people to come to different conclusions. What, one just brief point on that. I have never, I've been doing this for 32 years. David, you maybe a touch longer, too, but too longer. But um, I've never seen the, and I hesitate to use the word average, but the, 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 there's nothing average about Americans. But the, this, the average Mac out there living their lives, and right. I've never seen a greater distrust and disdain for institutions of power all the as now. That, Every, yeah. All the data shows that it's visceral, it's real. I don't know, does that get changed? But I mean, I, it's, that also impacts how voters, not just on the right left, but folks in the middle, receive their news. There's with a great deal of, of skepticism. Mm -hmm. And that's why I can tell you, and everyone talks about digital and, and it's so important, but grassroots, being able to reach out and touch Americans with people they trust and respect, mm -hmm. there's a premium on that like never before. Uh, because if you give them a, an op-ed from a major institution or, or a, a quote from someone, it's not going to work like this it is. This is why years Facebook ago. is so powerful. Yes. Sure. Because yes. people trust yes. information they get from friends more than they do very much so. uh, institutions. Yeah. I want to end on this because we are unfortunately short on time. But you know, you talked about skepticism and all of these things. What about fatigue? Right? This overload of information where it's kind of hard to get charged up about anything anymore because it's just kind of a constant onslaught. Is that something you worry about? Is that something, as an operative, you think you can kind of combat? I, I think the notion of fatigue is overblown. I, I do. I think that Americans, uh, I, 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 I mentioned anxiety earlier. I, I think they, there is anxiety out there. I was in uh, near Orlando, Florida, a pretty prosperous area. This was pre-Hurricane uh, Irma. Um, and I was talking to a, a gentleman there, an older man, and he said, you know, my son has a job, but it's not a career. Mm -hmm. I don't see a pathway forward for him like mm -hmm. I had one. And, and so there's not fatigue when they're looking at ways to fix that. I, I don't think it's fatigue. I think it's which movement, which party, which leaders can actually convince a gentleman like that, and he's not alone, that there is a pathway forward to, to a better country, but just as importantly, perhaps, a better life for that, that uh, I'm person. Tempted to, I'm tempted to here. say I'm too tired to answer that question. <laughs> uh, I, think, I, I think that Tim is on to something important here. At the end of the day, people are living their lives and they're, they, they, they have concerns for themselves and their families. They are not consuming all of this noise in the way that That's we right. in mm -hmm. the exactly bubble right. consume it. And they'll make judgment. People say, well, why hasn't the president's numbers changed? And they really haven't. They've been sort of mired in the high 30s almost from the beginning. Uh, people aren't going to walk. They're, they're, they're living their lives and when they have to focus, on their choices, they will focus. And the question they're gonna ask themselves is, do I feel like my life might be better if I go this way or that way? Right. Uh, does this offer hope for the question mm -hmm. that uh, Tim raises or not? And uh, all the rest of it is a circus. And they are paying uh, just uh, not as nearly as much attention to the circus as those of us uh, who are okay. wearing colorful outfits and <laughs> the monkeys and the grinders are, uh, do. I love it. Well, thank you, David and Tim. We really appreciate thank your you. time today. Thank exactly. you guys so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.